Hi everyone, welcome to Brain Talks. My name is Deborah Kahn, I'm the founder of Being Patient. I'm really excited um, to have with us um, Dr. Martha Claire Morris. She is the lead creator of the Mind Diet and the director of the Rush Institute for Healthy Aging and the Mind Center for Brain Health at Rush University in Chicago. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions about diet, what you can believe and can't believe, and what, what I find very exciting about the Mind Diet is there's been a lot of research around it. So welcome, Dr. Morris. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's just start first with the research, because I mean, I know at Being Patient, we get questions all the time. What can I believe? What can't I believe? Um, and why a lot of people always quote the mind diet is because there's been an extensive amount of research that has gone on to support the mind diet. So could you tell us a little bit about what your research found and really what the how the study was conducted. So I've been doing research on nutrition in the brain for many years, over 25 years. And um, we've been studying individual nutrients, antioxidant nutrients were the ones that we started off with. Um, we looked at uh, fat composition and we looked at fruits and vegetables and seafood. And um, all of those things um, we found to be associated with slower decline in cognitive abilities and also a reduced incidence of Alzheimer's disease. And um, after all these years, we thought it was time to do a randomized trial where you actually ask people to change their diets to follow a certain way and look to see what effects that had on the brain. So that's the, um, the standard by which we say that um, a risk factor is causal uh, to in protecting the brain is by a randomized trial. So in preparation for the randomized trial, we had to come up with a diet. So we put together all of these years of research the foods um, and the, the foods that were high in the nutrients that we knew to be important for the brain. And so that's how we came up with the MIND diet. And uh, before we went and asked people to follow it, we, um, we, we provided a score to show um, how well people were following the MIND diet. And we tested it out in um, one of our studies here at Rush. Um, where we had collected diet on this population for years. And uh, we took what they, uh, questionnaires they filled out on what foods and um, that they consumed and how often. And we assigned a mind score. And then we uh, looked to see what their cognitive abilities were over time. And we found that people who scored in the top third of sc um, scores on the MIND diet had um, a, a very little change in their cognitive abilities over time. And in fact, they were the equivalent of being seven and a half years younger in age compared to people who scored lowest on the diet. So it's a pretty dramatic effect. And then we uh, looked at who developed Alzheimer's disease. And we found that people in the highest um, tertile of scores had a 53% reduction in the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Even people who were in the intermediate range for adhering to the diet, they still had a 35% reduction. So um, that was pretty exciting that um, we found such a, a strong association. And so that allowed us to go forward with this trial that's currently ongoing as we speak. So what is it, uh, well, before, obviously we're gonna get more into the diet and um, what you found specifically, but um, how big, um, I mean, obviously the, the first results were encouraging enough so to make you push forward with your study. Um, just how many people are being tested and how long will it take until you have more information? 
the current trial is a three-year intervention, and we have 604 people that are in the trial. So we just are finished. Are people who are worried, are they, are they worried about their memory? Do they have MCI? Are they just? These are, these are people who are overweight um, and they have poor diets. They don't have cognitive impairment um, and they're otherwise pretty healthy. So um, we're taking sort of a general normal population that's 65 to 84 years of age, and we randomize them to the MIND diet or just a very mild calorie restriction, uh, just 250 calories per day we ask them to reduce. So um, yeah, we'll know in 2021, that's when the trial concludes. I've always wondered that though, because memory is a tricky thing, you know, people, different degree of um, decline in their memories and it's not really consistent. So what is it that you're looking for over the three year period? Our primary outcome is change in a, um, a large group of tests on cognitive abilities. So uh, we measure it five times throughout the three-year intervention. So we'll have a very good measure of people's overall cognitive abilities and um, how they change over time. We are also doing brain MRIs, um, magnetic reson resonance imaging, so that we can see if the diet will slow atrophy of the brain that occurs um, as people age. So let's get a little bit into the specifics of food. Um, you know, there's so much out there. There's so much information out there. Um, right. And I know the mind is similar to, I mean, it's, very, it's a proponent of the Mediterranean diet. Is that right? Um, we took the backbones of the Mediterranean and the DASH diet. The DASH diet was developed to uh, prevent hypertension and lower blood pressure. And they have very many um, components that are in common, the DASH and the Mediterranean. And they've both been demonstrated to be very healthy diets for uh, many chronic conditions, but primarily cardiovascular conditions. Um, so we took the backbone of that because we knew it was an overall healthy diet. And then we modified each component based on the literature that's specific to brain health. So I'll give you some examples. Um, the Mediterranean and the DASH diet both have four or more vegetable servings per day and three or more fruit servings per day. So when we looked at the literature on fruits and vegetables and cognitive decline and um, dementia, we found that it was really the level of benefit was at two or more servings a day. So that's what we made the MIND diet. We said two or more vegetable servings per day. And then we also noted that so many um, large studies found that it was leafy green vegetables that in particular were healthy for the brain. So we specified, we said eat two or more servings of vegetables per day and make one of those a leafy green. So that's spinach, kale, collards, uh, romaine, lettuce, the darker your leaf, the greener dark green leafy um, part of the plant is where most of the uh, nutrients, they're very nutrient dense in nutrients that are shown to be important for the brain. So that's one component, the vegetable component. The fruit component, three or more servings per day. Um, when you go and look at the studies on nutrition in the brain, fruit consumption as a general category is not associated with protecting the brain. But berries uh, raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, any type of berry have been shown to be important for the brain. So instead of making any recommendation on fruits, 
we specify berries two to five times per week. So that's how we went through component by component. Do we know why? So for example, you take something like fruit and um, you have um, isolated berries as good for the brain, but do we know why? Um, there's been some animal models that um, use different berry extracts. Um, I'll use blueberries because it seems to be the more potent for memory and cognition. Uh, and they fed a blueberry extract to rodents who were then put through little memory exercises. And then um, they demonstrated that the blueberry um, fed uh, rodents had better memory function and when they looked at the brains after the experiment they saw that the hippocampus which is where memories are formed that's a, one of the primary regions of the brain for memory the hippocampus was uh, larger in the blueberry fed rodents and anthocyanin is a um, type of uh, nutrient that are very high in blueberries. And they found that there were higher levels of anthocyanin in the rodents on, um, in the hippocampus that were fed the blueberries. So um, perhaps anthocyanin has some important function for protecting our memories and our hippocampus. Well, incidentally, um, there was a study that I read about in Japan where uh, it was, I think, a, a town near Okinawa where uh, a lot of people lived um, you know, well into their hundreds. And um, they, they were trying to isolate why this population was living longer. And it was hooked to the purple sweet potato, which is a sta staple of their diet, which has a lot of that element of anthracyanin, or however you say it. I, I always mess up the word. Um, anthracyanin, is that right? Anthracyanin is the one in blueberries, yeah. Yeah, and, and that same one exists in the purple yam, um, which is a staple um, in this particular part of Japan. So, um, you know, yet more evidence about, uh, about, you know, how a diet really, and incidentally, this, place had a lower incident of um, incidence of, of Alzheimer's disease as well. Yeah, it's difficult to pick out one item in a cultural um, difference like that. Um, so they also, I mean, vitamin E is also a nutrient that's high in the sweet potato, which has also been shown to be important for the brain. Um, they also eat a lot of seaweed uh, products and seaweed have um, omega-3 fatty acids, um, and one of them, DHA, it has been found to be very important for the brain. It it's, um, forms the membranes of the neurons and helps them in their synaptic communication and, and activity. Um, so there's multiple things about uh, their diet uh, that might lend to better uh, brains and um, also their lifestyle, they're active um, for uh, throughout their life. And, um, you know, stress levels, there's so many things in a culture that can contribute to better brain health. So a lot of what we're talking about, I mean, you know, some of it is just really common sense and the expression, what's good for your heart is good for your brain, you know, good for your mind. Um, so how much do we know, like, could, could this perhaps be just, if we're eating healthier, it's just better for us overall. Um, and how much can be really attributed to specific foods at this point in time? Well, um, the animal literature, where they're able to control everything in the environment of the animals and uh, feed them different nutrients and different foods, and then look at the brain and look at how it's functioning. Those experiments uh, pinpoint um, individual nutrients and individual foods that seem to be particularly specific to brain health. Um, so among those are vitamin E, folate, 
the flavonoids I mentioned, the anthocyanins, um, that fat composition. So having a fat composition that's higher in the unsaturated fats and lower in the saturated fats uh, lends to having a healthier blood uh, brain barrier uh, system to keep out foreign substances that can harm the brain and also get the good sub substances in the brain. So they have many different roles in the brain. There's not just one. So um, vitamin E, for example, is a very potent antioxidant. And one of the few antioxidant nutrients um, that we know of in the brain. So um, it's there to snatch up free radicals as they're generated so that they, the free radicals can't harm the neurons. So, you know, that's just one nutrient, one function. Okay, and we're getting a question um, from a viewer right now who says, I see a functional doctor who is pulling me off of gluten, dairy, and all foods that were causing me inflammation. She also tests all my vitamins, minerals, and heavy metals to ensure optimal levels. It's made such a huge difference in both my physical and mental health. My question is, is there's any current research on inflammation in Alzheimer's as it relates to food such as gluten and dairy. So inflammation is a big of course and, and, and so directly correlated with Alzheimer's. So how much do we know on that? We do know that inflammation is involved in Alzheimer's disease and other neurologic uh, conditions and diseases. That's for certain. Uh, diet can contribute to inflammation um, gluten and inflammation in diets, that is not, um, that does not have a lot of data behind it. Um, hopefully there will be, um, studies in the future that can support that theory. Um, the, uh, the, there have been some very well performed, well-designed, randomized trials of the DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet in which they demonstrated that inflammation, markers of inflammation were decreased um, by consuming those diets. So yes, having a diet that's um, higher quality, um, has uh, more of the, um, the nutrients uh, that we know to be good for health, and decreasing the diet components like saturated fats and sugars um, and salts in our diet. Um, having a diet that's healthy like that does lower inflammation. Okay, and we're getting another question um, about, uh, say, do you think most geriatricians or primary care doctors are aware of this diet? Um, I know about it uh, because I work at a university. So how well known, I mean, you're, you're substantiating, um, you know, with your findings, what really is directly correlated with diet and the brain. Um, how, how well known is that? Well, it was just developed and published in 2015, so it's very new. I, I get calls and um, contacts all the time by neurologists um, around the world that want information about the diets. They want to use it in their clinics. Um, so I do know that it's being used. Um, I'm Once we have the results of this randomized trial, we will um, make much more effort to publicize the diet uh, for people who want to protect their brains with age. Um, but I, I want to wait until we have this, this ultimate test of the diet. So if you have, I mean, this, you, you'll know in three years, that the study lasts for three years, this latest one, is that right? I, I'm sorry? The study lasts, this, this latest study is three years, you said, is that right? 2021, well, the, the trial will conclude and uh, we'll analyze the data and try and get the results out um, as quickly as possible. So 
you will know whether or not this is um, keeping people's cognitive um, health healthy, so to speak. But will we really know if this, if this really is a way to prevent Alzheimer's or maybe kick the can down the road a bit? It's more like kicking the can down the road a bit. Um, so the, the goal right now in the field of dementia is that if we can delay even by five years when people start to exhibit uh, signs of dementia, it will have tremendous implications for the public health, for um, the, the cost, the human cost and the human burden as well as the financial cost of the disease. We are planning to um, get further funding to carry out the trial for a longer period of time and actually uh, be able to make a, um, a conclusion about whether the diet can actually prevent Alzheimer's disease. So that is in the plans, but we don't have anything funded as yet. Okay. Um when um, one of the things that surprised me about the diet is, you know, have a glass of wine, which I guess a lot of us would be happy about, but uh, there's such um, a lot of conflicting information on drinking alcohol and brain health. So I'm curious as to why, um, why the wine was in there. The literature on alcohol consumption and dementia is pretty consistent and um, also the same that um, it is for heart disease, that people who consume very moderate levels, um, anywhere above um, zero drinks per week up to about uh, seven per week for women, no more than 14 a week for men, in that very moderate range, and probably the more moderate, the better. Um, those individuals have the lowest risk of dementia. And I want to be very careful to state and have people realize that every drink above those very moderate levels that you consume actually contribute to brain atrophy. So alcohol um, is harmful to neurons. For some reason, this very light, very moderate intake um, is seen, appears to be healthy for the brain. Okay, and we have um, some questions that were sent to us earlier. Uh, what am I saying? We do seem to hear that different foods are helpful in preventing dementia. Um, they seem to be in a of favor, and that's very true. You know, we often hear, do this, don't do it anymore. Um, the regular ones I've asked about are coconut, coffee, and chocolate. Um, are there any evidence uh, to support that um, these are indeed good for our brain? So coconut oil, there's no evidence. Um, that was a, a, a compelling one person story that really caught wildfire in, in the public domain. Um, there are some studies that are testing it directly, um, and we just have to wait for the results of those studies. Um, chocolate and coffee or caffeine are, um, they're kind of funny um, in that they have, uh, they're like drugs. They have an immediate impact on, um, especially coffee. You know, when you drink coffee or have some caffeine, it, it stimulates your, uh, your system and you do have uh, sharpness cognitively, uh, but it's short lived. Uh, the evidence for coffee or chocolate as being protective against the development of dementia, having more long-term effects or slowing of cognitive abilities, just isn't there yet. Um, uh, there are some studies on chocolate uh, that can perhaps um, give us uh, better data to understand whether that does have some long-term impact. 
So, um, so far, wine and chocolate, not bad at all. <laughs> right. Definitely. There. I don't know of research to show that chocolate is bad, but like anything, if you eat a lot of it, you're consuming a lot of calories and um, not eating other nutrients that your body needs. Um, what do we know um, specifically? What do we know about sugar? I mean, we know that sugar is the root of all evil. Is that true? There's no study that has specifically linked sugar to um, a healthy brain or um, or linked sugar to greater risk of developing dementia. Um, Sugar is often consumed in foods that are also high in saturated fat and in salts. Um, so overall, those high sugar foods aren't um, doing you any good. Um, and uh, they also, when you're consuming more uh, high caloric foods, you're not consuming other foods that your body needs, like leafy green vegetables. Um, so sugar um, is an empty calorie um, that isn't helping the body at all. So one of the things that you had said earlier is um, that the people who participated in the study were um, obese, I think you said, they're overweight. They're obese, yeah. So you're dealing with perhaps more than just Cognition, right? I mean, I, I mean, I'm assuming there may be some comorbidity in there, um, diabetes. Yes, we did not exclude individuals who had hypertension or diabetes or um, some uh, moderate levels of heart disease. Um, so there, all of those people are in there. Yes. Well, and we're measuring um, so many things in this study. We'll be able to see if people's glucose levels um, are affected by the diet, um, their blood pressure levels, um, the progression of various diseases, um, cholesterol levels. Um, we're looking at all of it because it's rare to have such a large diet intervention trial where trying to take as much advantage of this opportunity as possible. How much do you, will you be able to tell um, how one relates to the other? Um, I'm not sure I understand your so question. For example, <laughs> so for example um, you know, there, there's research going into like, Thing, what's good for the heart, it's good for the mind. How much are these things interconnected? So we know that people who have diabetes are more likely to um, to, to, to get Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if, you know, the diet is the basic building blocks to our health, right? And so if we reduce the chance or we reduce um, your other comorbidity factors, um, how much does that have an impact on your chance of getting Alzheimer's disease later? Well, well, well definitely, you're, you're correct. Um, having high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, obesity, particularly in midlife, uh, affect uh, your probability of getting Alzheimer's disease and dementia in late, later life. Um, we will be able to, because we're measuring all of this, we'll be able to look at the diet effects on cognitive change, and then we'll be able to see if it's accounted for by improvements in blood pressure and, and diabetes um, and cholesterol level. We'll be able to do that statistically. Okay, and um, we have a, a comment coming in um, about the coconut oil because um, one viewer says um, no, no coconut oil. Um, what about the use of MCT oil and the research on the ketogenic diet? Um, do you have anything to say about that? The ketogenic diet at this point is a theory. 
as that it will be protective for dementia and Alzheimer's disease. It's the newest fad. There's always some diet fad out there. And uh, this is the current one. There's um, very, very little data to support that the ketogenic diet um, is protective against dementia. There are some trials that are underway and um, we should have the answer um, in the next couple of years as to whether it was effective. Well, I, I guess given the, the fact that um, ketones, I mean, glucose is the main source of fuel for our brain, but ketones can also pass through the blood brain, brain, blood brain barrier. Um, do you think it's worth it to, to do more research on this? And it could actually biologically make sense um, that ketones could provide our brains um, with an alternative fuel and therefore that may be uh, good in the long run. I mean, is, is the theory? I definitely think that the theory is um, uh, tight enough that yes, we need to do a trial to see if it will be effective. And indeed, there is a trial um, in people with Alzheimer's disease. And I believe there's one in people with mild cognitive impairment as well. But I agree, we definitely need to do these studies. How much do you think um, research is taken seriously lifestyle, like uh, diet? Are there enough of these studies going on? It, it has changed in recent years. Um, there was a resistance by the uh, field of neurology that nutrition, um, diet, really had much of anything to do with the brain. Um, so, you know, part of that problem is that um, the physicians don't get much nutritional uh, training, um, but also the field of nutrition has, for some reason, never um, tapped into the field of uh, uh, neurologic conditions. So. Um, it's only been in the very recent years that there's been a change in both communities, the nutrition community and the neurologic field, that maybe um, there is something to diet in the brain. Should we be taking any supplements? I mean, there's so much information out there. Um, no one knows really what to believe. The whole supplement field, it's, it's, it's incredibly confusing to people. Um, you get a bit of news here and there. Are there supplements you should be taking at this point in time? So the, the clinical trials that have been done on supplements overall have been very disappointing. There are some exceptions. Uh, there's been two uh, randomized trials in individuals with Alzheimer's disease that found that vitamin E actually had some benefit for uh, their daily function. Um, and there are trials that have been done to date have been very poorly designed. They've been designed like a medical model, like uh, taking a, a supplement is like a drug. When our, our bodies are designed to have a very intermediate level of nutrient, too little or too much, aren't uh, what the body wants. So when they do these trials um, and they don't consider whether the individual has adequate levels to begin with, and then they give them very high amounts, um, that's not really testing whether the, the nutrient supplement could benefit people who are deficient or have marginal uh, levels of that nutrient. So to give you an example of a successful trial, a very well done trial was done in the Netherlands and they um, targeted people who after doing biochemical tests, they determined that they were marginally or deficient in folate. And then they gave them a folic acid supplement for three years and they found significant uh, protection against um, cognitive decline among the folic acid supplement users. So that's an example of a well-designed study where they, um, there were nutritionists that, that were involved in the trial that knew that the body um, 
expels excess nutrient levels. It really is designed for some intermediate level. So um, a so, question. So Sorry. I will then answer your question. Should uh, the general public be taking supplements? I say no, whether you're deficient or you uh, have low levels, um, and then make a decision, uh, probably in concert with your physician, as to whether you should be taking a supplement. Um, but just random use, you're wasting your money. We don't, it's not a regular, regulated industry. You don't know that um, what they say is in the vitamin uh, supplement is actually um, true. So I avoid would avoid them unless you know that you um, are deficient in a nutrient. A lot of um, people write to us and ask, um, you know, I mean, you know, there's people like me who have a parent with Alzheimer's disease and all of a sudden I care a lot about my brain health. But there's also, what about in terms of a person who's already been diagnosed with Alzheimer's? How much can diet really help? That is an area that just has not been studied. Um, there's so few studies. The ones that have been done are so small. Um, that's a field that we really need to um, uh, put some resources into. It's an important question. Can we help those who already have the disease um, function at their best um, by various uh, dietary uh, changes? Yeah. So um, I just want to end by having you really name, um, okay, if we, could, if we could design the perfect diet for ourselves, uh, what would breakfast, lunch, and dinner look like? <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Um, I, I can tell you from my own personal um, behaviors that I try to um, have vegetables at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So uh, one of my favorite breakfasts um, is a slice of whole wheat toast with um, maybe some avocado slices um, on it, and then an egg. And I saute some spinach and squeeze some lemon juice on it, and it is delicious. So that's uh, one of my favorite breakfasts, and it's very quick. Um, uh, lunch, I try to eat a salad um, every day for, and then you can put beans on it or uh, maybe uh, some shrimp or um, some sort of seafood and you can put many different vegetables on it. Um, and then for dinner, um, you can, you know, have a, a, a piece of salmon with a sweet potato and broccoli those three meals there would provide you with a lot of the nutrients that um, have been shown to be brain healthy. And so if people want to learn more about the MIND diet, how can they do so? Well, uh, my daughter and I uh, have published a book that came out in December called Diet for the Mind. The first half of the book uh, describes um, dementia, and some of the uh, things that happen in the brain with dementia, and then describe nutrient by nutrient and food by food, um, what are, is healthy for the brain and what isn't, and some myths, and it talks about things like coconut oil. Um, and then the second part of the book are 80 recipes that my daughter, who's a trained chef, um, put together that um, use the ingredients of the MIND diet. So um, that would be an easy way to learn about it. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Martha Claire Morris, for joining us uh, from Rush University in Chicago. Um, we wish you all the luck with your research, and we certainly hope that you do keep us updated. Um, we're really interested to hear about the results um, of your latest study. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us.